Welcome back to our study of the book of Isaiah. I'll ask if you will to please be turning to chapter 19 as we're going to resume our study uh, of the burden against Egypt. As always, I appreciate those who of you who are turning in and your interest in the study of the Old Testament. Romans 15 chapter 4 tells us that, that those messages are still vital, still pertinent today. They're written for our learning. As we better understand the Old Testament, it's my belief that we'll better understand the New and be able to understand many of the passages that are used, especially as we see many quotes coming from these books. Uh, we see how God works. We see the nature of God on display. We see situations very similar to those of our day as well. God never changes. And so therefore we can learn from his dealings with others how we see so many of these lessons that would be applicable to us today. In our last lesson, we were looking there at chapter 19. Chapters 13 through 23 of our text, remember, are a series of burdens against those neighbors, those roundabout God's children. And one after another, we see a, a difficult message of judgment that is coming. That's what the word burden has to say. It's an uncomfortable message. It's a powerful lesson. But it's also a message that speaks of destruction that is to come. And we, we see that all men through these things are amenable to God's word. We see all of those um, who have the responsibility of following God's word or they're going to face the judgment of God. And so we see the particulars of that as we look at this section, chapters 13 through 23. We're moving toward the end of that now. And we're going to be shifting our message somewhat as we continue through this series on the book of Isaiah. In our last lesson, we began looking at the oracle or the burden against Egypt. And really all of chapter 19 carries that thought. As a matter of fact, chapters 19 and 20 uh, both deal with Egypt. When you look at Egypt, we remember the past that uh, God's people had with them. Remember the Exodus. That jumps first and foremost to our mind. But we also see the alliances that were a temptation for God's people to, to enter into an alliance with another power who was a power. And it was often the case with Egypt. And so part of the message that we're looking at here in these lessons is that it is fruitless to enter uh, into these relationships with these others because they're going to go down as well. So chapter 19, verses 1 through 15, we're not going to read that again. I, I just want to kind of hit the high spots on where we were uh, in our last session. We're looking at God's judgment against Egypt, and we looked at several ways in which that judgment was going to be seen. First of all, in verses 1 through 4, we see an internal strife that is going to be in existence. You have God being pictured as moving on a swift cloud, coming to them uh, as it relates to that judgment. He's using language very, very similar to the psalmist of Psalm 104 and verse 3. Ancient people often use the metaphor of deities riding on clouds speaking of their uh, prestige, speaking of their power, and oftentimes speaking of the swiftness with which they would come. Remember that Egypt worshipped about 75 different gods. But the point here is that they were not going to be brought down militarily. We are, we are going to see that still uh, being a possibility, but in this aspect of the judgment that's coming against Egypt, He's talking about an internal strife that is going to be seen probably in a, a different dynasties of pharaohs and the conflicts that they had uh, with one another. And that would bring down their eventual collapse. As I mentioned last week, remember Rome that fell in the same way. It was internal corruption that brought them down. And, and, and God seeing as bringing them down, using some of those events uh, in very much a, uh, a, a a powerful display of his judgment, providentially working rather than miraculously working in many cases. This is going to demoralize the Egyptians, and they will be delivered into the hands of a cruel master. Again, we see play on words there. We see very uh, similarities. Remember that when the Israelites were brought under bondage in, in Egypt back in the day of the Exodus, that they were placed under cruel taskmasters. And so uh, what goes around comes around. The law of sowing and reaping is often seen as we look at these things. 
The second aspect of God's judgment against the Egyptians is seen in verses 5 through 10 of chapter 19, and that is an economic collapse. Remember that many of these countries prided themselves in their economy, and oftentimes they attributed the success that they enjoyed and the prosperity that they had, the wealth that they enjoyed, to their idols. And that was often the case here with Egypt as well. Again, remember, we go back to the Exodus and we see the ten plagues were basically judgments against the gods that were seen as over each different aspect of the plagues that were brought uh, against Egypt. You're looking at, at, at an economical problem here. You're looking at a country that was very dependent upon the, the floodwaters of the Nile and the benefit that the land would receive from that. But the economy is going to come down. Here it says the pillars of Egypt are being crushed, probably referring to the idols and the obelisks that represented those idols that are seen. Then in verses 11 through 15, we saw the political collapse that would come. Three different phases that were spoken of there in verses 1 through 15 regarding God's judgment. The princes of Zoan are said to be fools there in verse 11. Uh, Egypt was known for its wisdom literature. Remember during the time of Alexander, that's even going to be seen as more so because in Alexandria, a library is going to be seen. And about 250 BC, we see the Septuagint translation, the Hebrew translation, excuse me, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And it's going to be done to be placed in that library at Alexandria. Much of the wisdom literature that is characterized in the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, books such as that, were also found a great deal here as we look at a lot of the archaeological finds and discoveries uh, that have borne out these things. Then right toward the end of our lesson last time, we shifted toward another context, and that's chapter 19, verses 16 through 25, as it relates to God's plan, how, how he's going to bring about some of these things, or specifically, what are his plans as it relates to Egypt? When we look at this burden, when we look at this oracle that's delivered against them, we're going to see five paragraphs. And we only looked at the first one in any detail last time. We looked at five short paragraphs, and every one of them include the phrase, in that day. And that's what we see, excuse me, that's what we see as a dividing mark between each of these five paragraphs. It moves from judgment upon Egypt to the promise of redemption for Egypt and the rest of the world. Something that I find interesting, personally, about these studies through these Old Testament books is oftentimes people don't want to study these books. They don't want to study the major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They don't want to study the 12 minor prophets because often all they see is the gloom and doom, and there is much of that. There is a lot of emphasis on God's judgment, and that's part of the message that these prophets bring. But also within those judgments, we see God extending hope. We still see an opportunity for God's people to come back. It's very seldom that we see a, a message of judgment that comes in which there's not a sense of hope being portrayed. I'm teaching the minor prophets this quarter at Brown Trail, and we covered the book of Amos today. And Amos is one of those books where, yes, Amos is sent to be a prophet. But his message is that God is going to send judgment on them. They had been warned numerous times. They had There had been plagues. There had been blights. There had been uh, famines, droughts, locust plagues. Through the book of Joel and Amos, we see these natural disasters that are coming that are brought by God with the intent of bringing them back to repentance. However, in the book of Amos, it's almost too late that judgment has come. The valley of decision that's being seen there, multitudes in the valley of decision, uh, is not giving these people an opportunity to come back and to repent of their sins. Instead, it is seen as a place where God is going to render his verdict. It's already there. They had been given opportunity, and now uh, they're not going to be able to get away from the judgment that's going to come. 
That's the book of Amos in a nutshell. Well, let's look here at the book of Isaiah. As we see Egypt being portrayed, there is going to be a sense of hope that is going to be seen. So we do still see a, a bright light possibility. And, we, and I've said all of that to say this. I want to challenge us to see that these books are not just messages of gloom and doom, but they're also messages of hope. They are messages that show God as judge and the wrath of God and the justice of God that's coming down. But they still also show the mercy and the grace of God as we see hope being provided. And we'll move toward that as we move down again through this chapter. So let's look back at chapter 19, verses 16 and 17 again. And let's look at this first paragraph, this first sense of a message against Egypt regarding God's plan, how he's going to do this. And this is that the Egyptians are going to be terrified in verses 16 and 17. In that day, Egypt will be like women and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he waves over it. And the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. You see, this is a judgment. This is a sense of punishment that's already been set by God. It's already been determined. And it's spoken of as being carried out. Remember in lessons in the past here in the book of Isaiah, I've used a phrase that's important for us to remember, and that is the prophetic perfect. The prophetic perfect was, was a rhetorical tool uh, in, in the Hebrew language, the way they taught, that basically talked about the reality of something and being assured and confident that it's going to happen, though it's future, by speaking of it as if it has already occurred. Chapter 53 of Isaiah uses it through the bulk of that chapter. Uh, as we see, he was wounded was wounded, though we see that speaking of the cross over 700 years before it's fulfilled. And so here in, in, in a way we see that as well. We see judgment being spoken of in, time, in, in past tense, even though we know that it's a future event that's going to occur uh, as it relates to those things. When we see the language here, there's nothing positive about this. We see terror, we see dread, we see trembling. All of those are going to be the dominant emotions that are going to be manifested by the Egyptians. find it interesting how we see also general terms being used. I've known a lot of ladies who were brave. I've known a lot of women uh, who didn't have a scared bone in their body. Yet in a very general way, we see women being portrayed as weaker. We see women, women being portrayed as those who are afraid. And that's the way that it's used here in a very symbolic way as it relates to that culture, as it relates to that time, that society uh, that's being spoken of. The wrath of God on evildoers is obvious, and the wrath of God is designed to bring this terror and fear and dread and trembling as being spoken of here regarding Egypt. Now, let's look at verse 18, and the second reference here, or the second plan, is that Egyptians swear allegiance to the Lord. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. The number five there could very well refer to five literal cities. But quite often we're looking at figurative language here in the use of numbers. And so it could just be a small number. Uh, is what's being said. Ten would be a number of completion. Five would be a number that falls short uh, of that. Who was this? What were these cities? Well, Haley said again that it could either be a literal number or it could be just a small number representative of others. But the language that's referenced here seems to be of merchant people that are involved in this group that is being spoken of as swearing allegiance to God at some point. Thirdly, verses 19 through 22, let's look and see Egyptians to worship the Lord. 19 through 22, Egyptians to worship the Lord. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. 
for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a mighty one, and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day, and will make sacrifice and offerings. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. And the Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord, and he will be entreated by them and heal them. A lot to say there. A lot of different pieces to this. But let, let's see if we can't break this down. There in verse 19. You're looking at an altar being spoken of, a pillar also being spoken of. You're seeing two different things that they would understand. When you look at the Egyptian culture, they had altars, they had pillars, they had obelisks that were representative of their gods, their foreign gods there. But here you're looking at an altar being made to the Lord and a pillar being erected to the Lord. Those pillars, those obelisks, were things that were erected that were intended to be memorable, to be a commemoration for them to memorialize that event and to see what happened. And that's how this situation is being spoken of. It's, it, it, it's an event that is being memorialized by a pillar that's being erected to the Lord. Altars are going to be made and sacrifices are going to be offered to the Lord there. Now, verse 20, I want us to pause for just a moment here because this appears to be much more messianic in nature. Quite often, when you look at uh, pronouns that are used, oftentimes the New King James will, cap will capitalize those that were either pronouns or there will be words that are used uh, to, to represent people, names that are, are given to them. And that seems to be the case here. For they will cry out to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior. The New King James capitalizes the S there. And a mighty one, and he will deliver them. And quite often this is done to represent deity as best they can in the way that they write those names. This is very similar to the language of Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 11. Those two would go hand in hand. And so I have no problem whatsoever with this speaking of a future event that's well over 700 years in advance, because often these are situations in which some of these messianic prophecies are made. Then when you look at verses 21 and 22, the Lord will be known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know the, the Lord. The words known and know are from a Hebrew word that, that references and emphasizes an intimate knowledge. When you look at the words worship, sacrifice, offering, and vow, these are all words that are used in a covenant context. For Egypt, they recognize those terms because they're often used in idolatry as well. But it still speaks of the relationship between them and their idols. But at this point in this future event, God's plan on working with Egypt, we're going to see those altars being made to God. We're going to see those pillars being erected to memorialize the Lord. And so we're seeing a point in time when we're going to see more of a covenant relationship between God and Egypt. When I think about this, I can't help think, but think uh, from a messianic perspective. When I go to the New Testament, there in the book of Acts, I think about the Ethiopian eunuch, very much from this area. But I think about those who are going to be saved and, and they're going to take that message back. We see them spreading through Egypt with the gospel message. Paul said by the time that the book of Colossians was written, that the gospel had been taken into the whole world. So we should not struggle to see some of these things as messianic uh, in nature of what's being discussed. The punishment, key here, the punishment that was leveled against Egypt, that's going to come against Egypt, was intended to cause them to turn to God. And we're going to see at some point that's going to happen. Now, let's look at number four. This is unhindered access for worship. And this is in verse 23. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, 
and the Assyrian will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. We're looking at two ends of a spectrum here. You think about Egypt being a power to the south. You think about the Assyrians being a power to the north. Think about Syria, just a little bit to the east of Assyria. Think about all of those nations. And, 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 and you're looking at relationships that's spoken of by these. A highway in Isaiah as a metaphor for unhindered access or removal of alienation and separation. When I think about the words of Isaiah, I also think of Isaiah chapter 59 and verses 1 and 2. Our sins are those that separate us from God. And, and, and we find a barrier between man and God. For, for our relationship to be restored, something has to occur. And we see Christ bringing us back together reuniting man and God as Christ's sacrifice takes away the sins that separated us. We now have access to God. We can come before him. Think about the language that's used in Christ's sacrifice in the New Testament. Think about the veil of the temple being torn in two. That gives the people direct access to God. No more a, a, a veil, no more a barrier between us and the most holy place. Under the Old Testament system, it was only the high priest that had that access to God, and he had it one time per year on the Day of Atonement. When we look at the better nature of our system per the book of Hebrews, we now see that we no longer need a high priest. Christ is our high priest. We are a nation of priests, and we all now have access to God ourselves. We can approach him. We can pray for forgiveness. We, we can ask his aid, ask his help through all of that. So powerful languages. Later on, we're going to see Jew and Gentile being brought together. That was a great problem throughout much of the New Testament. John has borne this out in many, uh, so many times as he was looking through uh, those prison epistles in his lessons. He brought out so well. That was one of the major struggles in the first century was that Jew-Gentile problem. And we see Christ resolving that problem. When you look there at Acts chapter 15, which is a, a reference to the Jerusalem Council that met about 50 AD. You're looking at a problem that arose when Gentiles began to be brought into the church. And that, that letter that was produced there in Acts 15 on that occasion, an inspired letter, basically indicated we're not going to bind any of these extra things. Gentiles do not have to become Jews before they become Christians. There are four stipulations made there, and I'll save that for you to go and look and look at what we see being stipulated upon them. But Jew and Gentile, those races, those barriers are going to be taken away. That's what's being addressed here in verse 23 uh, of our text. Unhindered access for worship for everybody who will come to God on his terms. And then we look at verses 24 and 25, and we see that fifth paragraph, the final one. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Here we see unity in the Lord that is portrayed. And we'll probably spend a, a good bit of the rest of our time right here because there's so much to say today, especially with the political concerns that we're seeing. Let me deal first of all with the text and then we'll uh, address some application for us. Israel now is basically being told, don't have an alliance with Assyria. Don't have an alliance with Damascus. Don't have an alliance with Egypt. Don't have an alliance with Ethiopia because they're all going down. So here we're seeing destruction of these people. But later on, we're going to see everybody coming together. You remember that unhindered access there in verse 24. Israel's association with Assyria and Egypt is later going to be a blessing in the midst of the earth. Egypt there is referred to as my people. Assyria is referred to as the work of my hands. But this reconciliation 
is only going to be possible when the barriers that bring it about are dissolved. First of all, I want to talk just a minute or two about the political scene today because I'm afraid that I'm seeing more division in the Lord's church that has its roots in politics today than maybe at any other time in, in the history that I know of. I'm seeing brethren who are at each other's throats on social media. I'm seeing a lot of arguments that are being seen. I'm seeing a lot of naysaying. I'm seeing a lot of conspiracy theories. I'm seeing statements such as, well, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't have voted that way. We don't need to allow these things to divide us. At maybe more than any other time in history, we see the need for unity in the Lord's church. We need, we need for, for unity within congregations. Brethren, we have too much to do to squabble and divide over things like this. I have only one form of control as to who takes the place of government, and that is my vote. I'm to at least respect the office of those who are there. But brethren, I'm not going to fuss. I'm not going to fret over things I cannot control. I'm going to live my life with Jesus as my Lord. That's the one whose law that I follow. As long as our government requires things of us that are not contradictory to God's word, I'm going to follow what they say. I'm going to deal with this situation. Later on, I'll attempt again with my vote to try to turn things, but I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to be sarcastic. I'm not going to get into name calling. And we especially need to see that between our brethren. It's also a lesson for us to learn on a religious perspective. And this maybe is more important. I, well, it's not maybe. It is more important. We are divided religiously today. And I'm just thinking of our country alone. Thousands of denominational groups. Many who call themselves the church. And yet we see so many different strains of religion being practiced. We have a call today by what's known as the ecumenical movement, the emerging church. You can call it what you want to call it, the community church. But basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to only agree on a couple of things and then agree to disagree on everything else. Unify on the fact that Jesus is Lord. Unify on God's will as that goes. But there's still so much division. And brethren, Unity is not going to come through compromise of biblical truth. Unity is going to come when all of us adhere to God's word and his word only. Unity can only come through conformity. And I'm not talking about conformity as it relates to cultural norms, as it relates to societal views on these things. I don't care if every person in our society agrees that those thousands of different religious groups are all valid. Because you see, man doesn't make that, man is not that standard. God is the standard. His word is the standard. We have characteristics that are portrayed for us in the New Testament as it relates to what makes the Lord's church the Lord's church. I use this illustration a lot. I've got a uh, 2014 pearl colored Toyota Highlander. On that Highlander, in the back glass, I've got a Brown Trail School of Preaching Spanish program decal that's there. So I can walk out of Walmart, even if I'm parked around 10 other pearl 2014 Highlanders, and there's still another qualifier that makes it my car and needs to have that emblem on there. I recognize those traits, I recognize those marks, and that's how I recognize my car. How does the Lord recognize his church when we see the traits of the first century church? We see the need for unity. God's provided for unity through his word. And we need to be those who adhere to his word and come together and have the unity that God intended. Whether we're talking about brethren being at odds with each other, or whether we're talking about religious groups being at odds with each other, God desires unity, but it's only upon his standard and by his will. Thank you again for joining us in this study of the book of Isaiah. Lord willing, next week we will continue.
And we'll begin looking at Ethiopia and Egypt together there in chapter 20, looking at their humiliation, their becoming destitute, as we see further things about that judgment. Until then, God bless you.